Well, good afternoon and welcome to our Lunch and Learn webinar series. Uh, today's topic is Business and Career Values, the Driving Force Behind Behavior. Today uh, our webinar is brought to you with the support of our sponsor, University of Fredericton. My name is Krista Ross, I'm CEO at the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, and our presenter today is Lynn Fear. Lynn has a varied background in social services, recruitment, business, and sales, as well as health, fitness, and nutrition for over 25 years. She specializes in services for businesses providing NLP training, corporate values alignment, sales training, as well as weight optimization and fat loss, sports performance, chronic pain, quitting smoking, releasing negative emotions such as anger, sadness, depression, anxiety, fear and guilt, stress, and PTSD, using specific modalities that work with our unconscious mind. So without any further ado, I ask you to welcome Lynn Thier, our presenter today. Here you go, Lynn. All right, so welcome everyone. And let me start off by asking you a question. So what's important to you about your career or about your business? What motivates you to do what you do? And how would you like to learn more about yourself and why you might do what you do? If you're with me, you can put a little yes into the chat box so I know that you understand what I'm saying. So just what are values and beliefs? Oh, I wanna to go to the next one, there we go. So my goal for you today is to go away with an understanding of how values impact behavior and productivity in the workplace and essentially in your life as well. So what are values, beliefs, and attitudes, and why do marketing companies spend millions of dollars studying them? Values are what actually motivate you to do what you do. A value is a hot button, and it drives your behavior. So whatever we do is to fulfill a value that, that you might have, and even though that you might be unconsciously aware of that value. So values are stored in our unconscious mind, which we make purchases directly related to what we value, and we move towards or away from what we value as well. So Tony Robbins is NLP trained, and he states that um, values are like a compass that directs your life. Values motivate and demotivate us, and they also justify behavior. So values are organized in a hierarchy with the most abstract ones having the greatest influence. So Dr. Claire Graves was a psychologist, a professor of psychology, and whose theory holds that human beings exist at different levels of existence. They have different thinking values. And his theory holds eight human development levels, which have de been defined thus far. So the eight human development levels have been defined and in my one day seminar that I'll be doing in October, we explore each level as well as do a specific values test so that you can find out what values level thinking you are at. And it will explain more about how you think and behave as well as where there might be conflict and how it can be cleaned up so that you're moving towards more of what you want. So why discover and refine your knowledge of values? So we wanna go over four benefits to you. So the first benefit is easier decision-making. It becomes easier and more effective to make good decisions in business or in another area of your life. So when you know your values, making clear decisions is more possible. So let's say that you're offered a new job that pays more than your current job. Will you take it? You're best off making the decision according to what you consider most important in your life. You'll be making more money, so that might support a value for financial success. However, you'll be spending less time with your family and with your loved ones. So that could go against a value for relationship and family. So which value is more important to you, relationships and family or financial freedom and success? If you're really clear about this, the decision-making process will also be clear you'll be able to make that decision much easier. The second benefit is life gets much simpler. Instead of working smarter, not harder. So let's face it, life can be complicated 
And it could be simpler if you really understand what's most important to you, not just in your business or, or your career, but in all areas of your life. Knowing and trusting your values can save you years of headache, heartache, and also a lot of hassle. Thirdly, another benefit is life is stressful for many. So going against core values causes inner conflict. Inner conflict is stressful in itself. In fact, studies show that this kind of stress trumps other forms of stress. For example, a lot of us think that our busy schedules cause a lot of stress day to day. And they can, but it's not as stressful as that inner conflict that accompanies it, which may also be related to your values. So inner conflict takes our energy away from us, so comes in the form of looking at. And the fourth benefit is that relationship compatibility becomes much easier. So you value relationships at work and talking with colleagues instead of perhaps focusing on projects and sales. Your boss, on the other hand, values success, results, and income. Perhaps you value relaxed pace and a relaxed schedule. Your boss might value hard work and extra hours put in. So can you see how there could potentially be a conflict here? Yes, there could be a conflict in this situation, and knowing your values can help alleviate that or even aligning those values to the values of the company or the values of the business owner could be of great benefit. So who am I? My name's Lynn. I'm an NLP master coach, consultant, and trainer, author of the book, Your Life Matters, and I help companies to get clear and focused on what they want, what they need in their company, what they value, and also to align management values, people who are in management, and then again, it trickles down to the employees and everyone in the entire organization. So let's talk a little bit about NLP. If you've never heard of the term before, it's been around since 1970, neuro-linguistic programming. So NLP was created by Richard Bandler and John Grinder back in 1970, and they worked at modeling the techniques of Fritz Perls, the founder of Just Talk Therapy, Virginia Satir, family therapist, and the Dr. Milton Erickson, who was a famous hypnotherapist. And they developed cut straight to the heart techniques that work to produce behavior change in people. So how great is that? So NLP, what is it? It's a user manual for your brain. And it's comprised of your neurology or your nervous system, which is how the body and the mind interact. The language you use to talk to others as well the language that you use to talk to yourself. Do you talk to yourself on a daily basis? I bet you do. And it gives insights into a person's thoughts by paying attention to their language. And the P stands for programming. So Bruce Lipton states that we've basically been programmed by the age of six with our core values and beliefs. So what programming was programmed into you, into your unconscious mind when you were little? NLP is designed to help us access more neurological pathways, thereby creating more choice in our life. So Anthony Robbins states it's a set of tools to deal with the blocks that we've created to simply being who we really are. And NLP techniques can help you improve how you think, behave, and feel in all areas of your life. So moving on, what is hypnosis? Hypnosis is a state of trance. It is focused attention and visualization, as well as enhanced capacity to respond to suggestions. So did you realize that you are actually in a state of trance or hypnosis several times a day? When you're driving along and you miss that exit, which happens to many of us, you're actually in a state of trance or hypnosis. When you're watching a TV show or a movie and someone's yelling your name trying to get your attention and you don't even hear them, Again, you're in a state of trance or hypnosis. It's a little bit different than meditation, but hypnosis, we are actually in it several times a day. So it's not a word to be afraid of, it's a word to be embraced. And next, what is timeline therapy? So timeline therapy was developed by Dr. Todd James over 30 years ago now, and it's a process that helps us and assists us to let go of negative emotions from the past. For example, I worked with a man who actually had two companies, 
And he came to me for two reasons. Firstly, he had a fear of public speaking. So we actually did hypnosis with him for that. And within two weeks later, he was speaking to um, a group of over 100 people. So that fear was gone. He also wanted to come see me because he wasn't making the money that he wanted in his business. And so we did elicit his values. And making money in his business was one of his values. However, for him, it was number nine on the list. Remember, your behavior is driven by your top five values from the unconscious mind. So what we did was a technique and we actually brought the value of money up to his number three spot and we cleared up any negative beliefs he had around money from childhood. The negative beliefs around money that he did have was his father saying, money doesn't grow on trees, money's hard to make. So if you have negative beliefs around money, that's something to also look at. We also release limiting beliefs and decisions using timeline therapy and creating a future the way we want it by inserting goals into your future timeline. So values, let's get to the heart of it all. Values drive behavior. They provide the primary motivating force behind our actions and have a massive impact on our outcomes. Uh, they motivate us to do what we do and we move towards and away from our values. So values are the things that are important to us. They are how we decide whether our actions are good or bad or right or wrong. They are actually one of our filters in our brain. They are how we decide about how we feel about our actions. They guide our every decision and therefore our results. So if you look at this picture, you'll notice that values have a cluster of beliefs around them. When operating out of our highest values, we experience congruence and a sense of satisfaction. We like people who share our values and often have a strong reaction to people who don't share our values. When we experience conflicting values, it creates a dilemma and incongruence inside of us. Values can conflict at the same time in any situation. And arguments and disagreements, whether they're at work or in a family, are almost always associated with people having conflicting values. So every value does have a cluster of beliefs surrounding it. Beliefs are the convictions that we generally hold to be true. And beliefs are basically assumptions that we make about the world and our values stem from those beliefs. Our beliefs grow by what we see, hear, experience, by what we read, by what we think about, what we see on TV. Imagine, if you will, a stand with a cup hooks, and the stand is your value, with the hooks being the belief surrounding that value. When you take the belief um, around the value out, then the value will also be gone. So what are the sources of values? Well, firstly, is our family. We're born into our family, and out of our own awareness, sometimes unconsciously, we either accept or even reject family values. Did your family show love and affection, or did they avoid intimacy and feelings? Think about how your family was as you were growing up. Moving on to our friends. Around the age of four or five, we actually start to play with friends and socialize. Friends could become more important than the parents' values. Going on to church, did you attend church as a youngster? What was your experience there? Was it positive or was it negative? Who did you connect with? Or are you a spiritual being and what led you to that? School, school has changed greatly. Now there are computers, electronics, and the changes that we make in communication. So everyone nowadays has a cell phone. And most kids, you'll notice, teenagers, they're always texting on their cell phone. And kids nowadays that are texting on their cell phone most often are insecure with face-to-face -face interaction. And realize and know that when you receive a text, you're only receiving 7% of that communication. So you're missing 93%. Hmm, that's a lot to be missing, isn't it? So what's being taught has changed. It's more humanistic. Adapting the human mind to adapt to all of this technology can be very challenging. Moving on to geography. Where did you live and where did you grow up? So if you were someone who grew up in busy New York City, then noisy is normal to you. People being in your face walking in the street is normal to you. 
Now, if you were someone who grew up in Alaska, where it's very quiet and there's basically nobody around, then that's what's normal to you. And being in a noisy environment like New York City would really wreak havoc on your nervous system until you got used to it. Do you live in Canada, Mexico, the US or Africa? Different cultures and climates, warmer versus colder, forces your neurology and your nervous system to adapt neurologically. So when I was on vacation with my husband last year, we went to Florida and we were at the gym working out. They don't have any air conditioning. Well, I was sweating bullets, let me tell you. And it was mm, maybe 85 outside. And we asked, you know, how come there's no air conditioning on? They're like, what do you mean air conditioning? It's not summer here yet. They only put it on after it reaches 100. So again, their neurological systems, their nervous systems, people there were in the gym with sweatshirts on and they were just fine. So again, your nervous system will adapt to your geographical area. Economics. When were you born? 1920s, 30s, 40s, 70s, 80s, 2000? Thinking of your parents, you know, if your parents grew up in the Depression um, or kids that grew up in the era where maybe they had things given to them and, you know, they have it all, that versus growing up in the Depression. Did your parents scrimp by or save and spend? How do you think about money? Now we pay less for more, whereas before we paid less. Oh, sorry, we paid less for more before, but now we pay more for less. The media. So the media has hugely changed the environment that we live in. Just look at what has taken place over the last 100 years. We were introduced to radio, TV, and then internet and computers. We have no patience anymore. The faster, the better. We don't even want to scroll down on the screen anymore because what we think for our answers, it should just pop up right away because we want it and we want it now. It has changed our neurology, our attention span, and it's also changed how we relate to other people. Social media, another category now, because now we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, etc. Our kids are outside playing and chasing Pokemon Go, going around like zombies, and it can take over the unconscious mind, which is actually very dangerous. So social media can take and make our kids socially inept when they hide behind the keyboard instead of using face-to-face -face communication. So what's coming? Brain to cloud interface. There is no privacy. All is cataloged, changing humanity as we now know it. So moving on to the formation of values. So role modeling is something that humans do unconsciously from the time that they are born. We all role model others. And according to sociologist Dr. Morris Massey, we each go through major developmental stages. Think of what was happening in your life during these peak periods, who may you have been modeling? What surroundings, education, group affiliations, and significant emotional events influence you towards or away from certain values and certain value systems? So Morse Massey's stages, zero to seven are the imprint period. Basically, you are a sponge. There's 20 billion synapses are created. From 7 to 14 is the modeling period, and who you are is largely due to who you modeled around the age of 10. So think back, and who did you model around the age of 10? For some kids that are now adults, Bart Simpson was their role model. So think about that. I know for me, if you were in a sport, I had a coach, and my skating coach was a role model to me. So think back to when you were 10. Who did you role model? Moving on to the age of 14 to 21, the socialization period, here you take the model out to socialize and you actually try it on. You try it on in front of others. So one key thing to remember during this stage for our teenagers is when you try on who you're modeling, you can either be accepted or rejected from your peer groups. And this has a huge impact on your self-esteem and your self-worth. So if you think back to those years, you know, were you accepted or perhaps rejected? And how has that impacted your self-esteem and self-worth moving forward into adulthood? And age 25 to 30, 21, sorry, to 35 is the career period or business persona. 
So here you model who you relate to in the business arena and who you've learned from. So basically, who rules the roost? While values have an intangible quality to them, the rules by which they get satisfied or violated are often very tangible. Rules are your beliefs about, about what has to happen in order for you to feel good or bad about an experience, and that's from Tony Robbins. So rules, beliefs, and values. Rules are not about reality. They are about our experience of reality, and everyone experience is different. So we all have different models of the world or a different lens by which we see the world. And again, it's based on our core filters that are in our brain, our filtering system. And every second, we are bombarded with 11 million bits of information. But the brain can only handle 134 bits per second. So what happens to the rest? Well, we delete, distort, and generalize all the time. You could be in the same room, the same meeting as a colleague sitting right beside you, and they could take away something completely different from that meeting than you did based on your filtering systems. And values is one of those filtering systems. So this is why you cannot assume that you know what will satisfy somebody else's values until you know their values by eliciting them. You may think that staying late shows dedication, and someone else might think that dedication is getting their work done by 5 o'clock. So there could be a conflicting value right there. So while our values are usually out of our awareness, we constantly express them through our language, and indicate which are the most important through our behavior. So the simplest way to discover someone's values is to simply ask, what's important to you about X? So if you're listening values in the context of career, what's important to you about your career? And you keep asking that several times. Now, people will usually come up with about five answers, and then they'll say, I don't have any more. That's a block. That's a block with the unconscious. And then we'll keep asking, what's important to you about your career or your business? And you will get to two blocks, pushing those boundaries. And as you do that, the unconscious mind will bring forth a few more values. And those are the golden nuggets. Those are the ones that you really, really want. So as you can see from this picture, we have um, values in all areas of life. So when I'm working with a client, specifically on career, I elicit their career values or their business value. Um, if I'm specifically working with someone on health, then I will elicit their health values. What's important to you about your health? I've worked in the past with cancer patients, and I not only elicit health values, but I will elicit life values, which is not on this wheel. So I always say, add life values. What's important to you about your life? And so when working with someone long-term, I want to elicit the values in all areas of life because usually after we've done timeline therapy, hypnosis, and NLP techniques, the values will shift and change. And then if there are some values that actually need to be moved that have not changed, then we will do that in the end as well. So basically asking what's important to you about your life or what's important to you about your career List each value and continue asking what's important to you in the context of your career until you elicit all the values. This is where I push the clients to two boundary blank spots. And these are boundary conditions of their thinking. Here you'll often discover those golden nuggets, those vital values. Finally, I'll ask them, remember a time, a specific time when you were totally motivated in the context of your career? What was the feeling, the emotion just before the motivation? That, again, is another value that's stored in their unconscious mind that they may not be aware of. So after we've elicited all the values, the next step is to prioritize their values based upon their most important value down to the least important value. So what's most important to you? What's next? What's next? And after you get the whole list of values, then there's more questions that you want to ask. So some values can be an indicator of what we call a complex equivalence, one thing not necessarily equaling another. The questioning process to elicit the complex equivalence is as follows. I'm going to use the value of passionate as an example. 
So someone perhaps who had listened passionate as a, a value for their business, being passionate about their business or passionate about what they do. So how do you know when you're passionate? What does it mean to you to be passionate? And I would also ask, how do you know when someone's passionate with you? What is your evidence procedure for passion? What causes you to feel passion? And the real important question is, why is it important to you? Why is passion important to you? Depending on their language, they're either going to be moving towards or away from this value. And so this is where NLP comes in, listening to um, the specific language that they're using to describe what they're saying. So you could also ask, why is money important to you? Depending on their language, they'll tell me whether they move towards or away from it. So on the screen now, I just want to give an example of how you could use someone's values in persuasive communication. I did a, a two-day workshop with the, the team over at Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, and we actually looked at values and how to feed somebody's values back to them so that they actually have no choice but to have a yes answer to buy because you're actually using their values and not your own. So for example, if someone have, has the values of love, wealth, integrity, connection, growth, and freedom, in this case, you could feed their values back to them in a compelling, engaging sentence such as, Alex, if I could show you a way to grow your wealth, doing what you love with integrity, where you could connect with some wealthy individuals, would this interest you? And if I could also offer you the freedom to grow to whatever level you desire, would you go all the way and get the most of our trainings? So by using all the values in the proposition, you are creating a compelling proposition where Alex will be in total agreement because they are his values. Oftentimes, salespeople use their own values to try and sell a product or a service. And that's the mistake that they're making. If they get that no, what if you ask the client or the customer, what's important to you about whatever it is that you're selling? And once you elicit the client's values and feed it back to them, then they have no other recourse but to say yes, because it's that exactly what they said. It's their values. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit uh, more about towards and away from values. So toward values are when your motivation or reason for having the value is in order uh, to move towards something and to have something positive. So it's in your language when you say, I want, I can, I love, I get to, that's toward language values. And away values are when your motivation is negative, to move away from something or avoid something. Oftentimes you might be moving away from something that you actually don't want. So saying things like, I have to, I ought to, I should, I must, are examples of language that is more negative and is away from what you want. So towards values are when your motivation or reason for having that value is to move towards something or having something positive. So I want to take the example of money and poverty here for just a moment. If you're motivated towards money, you might say things like, I love making money. I create money easily. Money flows to me. Money is energy and is easy to obtain. If you're moving away from poverty, you might say things like, I don't want to be, full, be poor, I have to pay my bills, I have to make this sale today, or I need this sale to make my quota. Which type of thinking do you think will create better results? Moving towards creates consistent results, whereas moving away creates inconsistent results. And when you're focusing on what you don't want, you get more of it, because what you focus on expands. And one thing to note, which people aren't really aware of, is that your unconscious mind does not process negatives directly. So when you say, uh, I don't want to slip on that thing on the floor, your mind hears, I want to slip. Or if I say to you, don't think of a pink elephant, hmm, did you think of one? Did you picture it in your head? You probably did, but I said don't, so why did you? When you say to kids, don't run, 
off they go, running away. When you say, walk, please, then they'll actually slow down and walk. It's not their fault. It's their little unconscious mind doesn't process that word, don't. So changing your language will actually create better results. Also, what beliefs do you have around money? That money is hard to make, that it doesn't grow on trees. What was your upbringing? What did your parents think, say, do around money? Not everyone has a functional value system, and as adults, you are stuck with them unless you actually make an effort to change them. So let's use the example of money in the context of career or business. Um, if money is not in your top, I would say, four values in the context of your career or money, then you may not be making the money that you want to or possibly could. Um, you might think that money is important to you, you may work hard for money, uh, you may worry about money, but that does not mean that money is in your hierarchy. In fact, poor people probably think about money more than anyone else, and because they are focusing on the lack of money, that's exactly what they get more of. They usually have a high um, away from value towards poverty because money is not in there towards hierarchy. So just because you consciously think about money, does not mean that your unconscious mind thinks about money in the same way. Your decisions and behavior are guided by your values at the level of the unconscious mind. Then to bring about change, we actually have to work with your unconscious mind to create that change. And this is where the NLP tools and techniques are worth their weight in gold. So in simple terms, my approach is to help the client remove the poverty value from the away from hierarchy and add money as a value to the towards value hierarchy. There is a bit more to it than that, but the procedure is quite straightforward and simple to do. And we learn how to do this in our master's program with NLP uh, training. So here are a few more examples of toward and away from values. Away from values, perhaps not failing versus being successful. Now again, if someone part of the time has a fear of failure, and then on the other part says, yeah, I can be successful, but yet isn't fully 100%, you know, um, at a belief of being 100% successful. So in that case, there could be actually internal conflict in what we call a parts. So when we have internal conflict, we do a different technique, NLP technique called parts integration, where we integrate the two parts to become whole again. Another away from value could be ill health. Somebody focusing on, um, well, I don't want to be unhealthy. I don't want to be overweight. I don't want to have to take that medication. Again, every time you say what you don't want, you're actually installing it in the unconscious mind. It's going to give you that instead of focusing on good health. You know, I want to be at my ideal weight. I want to have energy and to be healthy. So focusing towards versus away from. People might also um, resist too much change. They might have fear of change versus um, a towards value of security. And lastly, an example of not feeling trapped. So some of us sometimes perhaps might feel trapped or stuck in a certain area of your life versus having the freedom of choice and exploring what are your values so that you can see that you do have more choice and to increase your choices. So how do you change your values if they're not where you want them to be? So after you discover the hierarchy of your values, you may want to actually change them. So you might want to make the money, or sorry, the value of money in the context of your work more important, or you might want to make the value of intimacy more important in the context of your relationships. If you are married, if you are in a relationship, I highly encourage you to elicit your own values in the context of your marriage or relationship, and then to elicit that of your partner. What's really cool is that you can compare the two, and you'll notice that your top five values are the most important. 
And if your top five values are all different, you might want to consider realigning your values because it will create more congruency and a better relationship. Now, changing values is an NLP technique taught at the master's level, and it's often used in business, in relationships, in education, as well as in therapy. So aligning people's values. So what management often neglects is ensuring that everyone within the company shares the core values, embraces the company's vision, and is truly a driving force in that same direction. So what would your company look like if your management team had their values all aligned in the same direction? Would it look different? Perhaps it would. Using NLP and timeline therapy processes, we can engage your team members and align their values to those of the company. The process alone is often responsible for elevating performance to heights never imagined before. So just imagine what it would be like if everyone in the company, though varying skill sets and focus, had a shared vision and passion for the company. Then imagine if they all shared the core company values at a genuine level. Or if you're a business owner, a small business owner, and you have a small team, imagine having your team members having the same values as you do with a vision for your business. So what to do next? Well, if you'd like, you can get in touch and take your company to the next level using NLP values alignment. And you can also register for our one-day seminar, Values the Driving Force Behind Behavior, which will be held in October 2017 this year. So I want to thank everyone for joining me today. If you have questions, I welcome your questions, and you can reach out um, through my website, lynnfear.com. My email is there, and I'd love to hear more from you. I also want to thank Krista and Wendy, as well as the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, for allowing me to uh, join you today for this webinar. Lynn, <clears throat> excuse me, Lynn, we can't thank you enough for this presentation. This has been some great information, and it's really given us a lot to think about um, how we can consider the challenges that we face and what we might do to, to face them more head on and face them better. So thank you very much for that. And uh, for anyone who is interested in uh, re-listening to this webinar, if you want to share it with somebody, it will be posted on our website uh, in a few days, and you can share it with your colleagues. Um, or um, listen to it again. So thanks again, Lynn. And just as a small thank you for your time and expertise, we're going to actually make a donation in your name to the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce Scholarship Fund. Um, and also, once again, we want to thank and acknowledge the University of Fredericton. They sponsor and host our Lunch and our Learn webinar series. So thank you again to Lynn Thier, and thank you to University of Fredericton, and thank you to all of you for tuning in. And have a great day, everyone.